a big moment for every company is when they finally decide to really invest in a data architecture, or maybe there already is a structure in place, but it's time to modernize it or completely overhaul it. Either way, this can be a really exciting time, but also kind of overwhelming. There might be a ton of different data sources you know you need to set up. There are expectations from stakeholders, and then everything in the middle, you have to figure out how to actually model and create the whole pipeline. But in today's video, I wanna share the approach that I often take with clients, which is a little bit different, and what I like to refer to as output-led engineering. It's a strategy that not only helps you set foundations from the start, but also helps narrow the scope so you don't get totally overwhelmed, while also giving you a way to get results to the business fast. The big goal is to help you avoid wasted efforts in this modeling approach or whatever it is you're doing, whether you're somebody who's building it or you're trying to plan one out. The main approach that I see a lot of times is let's say a company decides, all right, we want to build a data model or you get hired to a team where you're building one and you kind of get thrown in the mix. What a lot of teams do for some reason is they try to do it all at once and do a divide and conquer approach. Imagine here, these are different pipelines. Let's just call it for sake of example. And each of these X's would represent issues that have come across. And eventually you get to a point where all right, the pipeline worked, but you're always just kind of doing it in parallel and trying to get as much done and to just present that you have metrics of the number of models that you built or the number of pipelines that you built. And it's these metrics that you're relaying to the business to show your activity. But I don't think it's wise to equate activity with production. That's a quote from John Wooden. He's a great basketball coach. I'm a big basketball fan. But the idea here is just because you're doing a lot of things doesn't necessarily mean that it's productive or that it's beneficial to what your goals are. And that's why I have this here. A lot of times you see people just trying to do everything all at once and they just hurry up to make a mess. And if there's no strategy in place, there's no consistent approach, you're going to have some issues. And so that is really the crux of what I try to help teams do and what I want to teach you in this material. This is a problem for a lot of people because what we end up spending our time building, we build all these things, but what's actually useful is this because we're so concerned with getting things out the door. There's new stakeholder requests. There's new situations that we got to just build, go, go, go. And everybody's out here doing all these different things without really taking the time to think about why you're doing it and the strategy behind how you're building it. And it takes time. It takes thought. So unfortunately, we end up building a lot of things that's only a little bit useful. And maybe you don't believe me, maybe you haven't experienced this. So I wanna give you a quick example in my own personal experience of what this looked like. And I have this here, killing 2000 plus reports. And yes, that is accurate, that's not a typo. This is just to put in context of why modeling is so important and what can happen if you don't do it properly and just kind of go wild, wild west. We had at this time, this was the first company I worked at, probably. 4,000 reports, they were SSRS reports. And SSRS, if you're not familiar, it's Microsoft's reporting tool. It's really easy to create reports. Nowadays, most people use Power BI. There were so many reports out there and I'm like, there's no way that we're using all of these. What is all this? So I created a report on reports and identified that there were over 2,000 inactive SSRS reports that we have. Basically half of them, if not more, were not even used anymore or maybe used once a quarter, once a year. And there were just duplicates of so much and I just couldn't help but think how much time was wasted building these over the years. And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about this kind of graph here. And again, maybe you can relate to that. If not, this is a very real thing that happens. And a lot of teams don't even do this. Eventually, what we decided to do in this particular case was build a new data warehouse from scratch. And maybe in your case, maybe you're rebuilding something that was already there. But in our case, there was no warehouse. And we needed to really formalize something to get away from doing all these ad hoc, one-off query type things. And the way we did it, which became really influential in the way I approach things and what I'm going to explain throughout the rest of this, is we began with our most used and impactful reports. And by that, I mean, we identified what was the most important thing that the business was actually using. Because remember, what we're doing here ultimately is to serve the business. So what was the most important thing that we could identify? And let's work backwards from that rather than just aimlessly working based on whatever source data we have, because that is what got us here in the first place. So we identified the most useful uh, and impactful reports, and we were able to effectively reverse engineer our pipeline around that. So we didn't do it all at once. We built the foundations and then added on over time until eventually we had something that was really robust and populating a bunch of reports that we we're actually using, not just random stuff that we built. So what I want to now mention is this foundational pipeline approach. So approach number two, and it includes that minimum viable data model, which we're gonna talk about here. And so uh, if we look at this here, the difference is rather than again, randomly scattering and building, you begin with that one pipeline. So in our case, remember it's those uh, specific deliverable focus pipelines. And along the way, there's a lot more X's here. You're working out the issues as you go. You're establishing the different layers, your automation, your testing, 
your naming conventions, and most importantly, this core data model and the keys, the relationships, kind of what you want that to look like. Obviously, it can't cover everything. It's just for this scope, but it gets you from the beginning to the end, and you cover so much more than you would if you were just randomly going in different places. And with that in place, then you can then rinse and repeat for multiple new pipelines. And you can then go in parallel because you have an example to work off of that everybody on the team, or maybe it's just you can agree on, this is how we're gonna do it from here forward. And of course, there's always little hiccups along the way, nothing's perfect, but it's a lot more straightforward. You're gonna be able to move a lot faster and avoid that issue of just sprawling out and making a mess. So in this approach, the way I think about it is you're gonna plan from right to left. And by that, I mean, think about the visual from the result all the way back. But when you actually build it, obviously you're gonna build from left to right. And I'm gonna explain this a little bit further. And let me open this up here. We're gonna talk about what I call output led data engineering. And really this is just a way to narrow your scope to identify a single deliverable to guide your development. It's not saying that you're just foregoing all data modeling and all processes just to quickly get a result. The goal here is to narrow the scope. It's really, that's the main point of identifying that deliverable. So you don't get out of control too quick. So common examples, and I have this on the other sheet, is an existing report or dashboard or spreadsheet. Remember I mentioned before it was our most commonly used report at the first company I worked at. It could be a grouping of similar metrics for a company I worked with. We picked, I think it was three different metrics that they were most actively using or that was most important for them. So we built around that and figured uh, they were all kind of related, so it was easy to do. Maybe there's an overly manual process that your team does today that's a good use case to get yourself uh, ongoing to this new pipeline approach. Or maybe there's just a desired data set that you don't have today that you just want to build from scratch, and this is a good output to uh, narrow your scope and to use as a deliverable. And just as another point here, you want to avoid the temptation to overcommit when it comes to this, especially if you're just getting started and you're trying to discuss this with other stakeholders. Because our goal here is to build the process and build that pipeline. It's not just to build a report. That's kind of what I was saying. Once you have that scope in place, now reverse engineer that deliverable. Let me walk you through what this means. Hey, while in this video, we're talking about the overall strategy for implementing a foundational architecture, there are subtle things you wanna make sure you're checking off as you go through. So to help you with that, I have put together a free modern data checklist, which will align really well with this foundational pipeline. It'll give you the four main components that you wanna focus on as well as individual items to make sure you're covering. So if you're interested, there'll be a link below in the description and the first comment. It's something that will be really nicely coupled with this video to help you put the whole thing together. So again, if that's something you're interested in, there'll be a link below. But with that said, let's get back to the video. In this case, let's say you have a deliverable right here on the right, all the way to the right. And this is what I mean by right to left. We're gonna think about it from right to left. So we start, again, we're not building anything yet. Think about the deliverable. What kind of flat mark could you create in a presentation table to deliver that? What are the different columns you would want to see? What are the different ways you would wanna slice that up? And ideally, you kinda of want that to be built in a way that isn't just for this one report, but could potentially be used for multiple reports. Maybe your end result is a sales report, but can you think of other example reports that might use that or data sets or whatever? So again, it's not just one-to-one, -one, it's just helping to initialize the thinking. So what's that Mart layer looking like? And this is all gonna take some thinking. Once you figure that out, we're gonna talk about this more in a minute, but what's the main fact of that mark? And by fact, I'm talking about the business action. What is the action really happening here? And as you can already tell, I like to go towards the star schema approach. So with that in mind, the other part of this is, all right, what are the dimensions around that fact? You know, the different context. So you might have a specific action. What are the different types of context we can think that are around that? And how, again, does that relate to this result mark that we wanna have here? And then from there, the next two kind of go hand in hand because as we mentioned, staging is one-to-one -one with the raw table. And so we can say, what are the source tables that we would need to create this warehouse and to ultimately present this? Like, where is this all coming from? And the goal here is to identify as few source tables as possible, just only what you need. But again, as you can see here, you can establish some naming conventions. So here's a way to do that. And you can establish the landing zone separation, like we mentioned before. And all this is narrowed in scope, but all this right here is strictly planning. Now you have your game plan effectively in front of you to actually go about building this. And I actually have a playground example here. This is from my larger course where you go through and build all this stuff. But here's an example that we do in that course. So the output is daily NBA game summary. That's a report that we wanted to build in that case. That's what we go through in that course. 
The March table we identified was NBA games detail because not only can that give us a summary report, but we might be able to use that for other examples. Then we can see in this case, the core action involved with NBA games detail that we can think about would be a game played. That is the action in this case that we would really be working around. So that would be the fact of our data model. Then what are the contexts around that? We can think of dim games, a dimension model around games, maybe teams, dates. These are all contexts around the games played. And then there are potential future dimensions that could be added. They may not be necessary to derive this first result, this first deliverable, but you can see how you could very easily plug that into the existing model that we're building and start to think about future things that you could do in that case. And then for staging, where there are specific tables that we know we're grabbing from these two different data sources. And here are the different ways that we could name them. Again, same naming convention that we're establishing up front. This is a convention that I like to follow STG for staging underscore the name of the source two underscores name of the table. It's just makes it clear right away exactly where that's living. So it's a staging model. There's a source and that's the table. So that's the stuff again. It's a playground example of exactly what I'm talking about. Then it's time to implement. So you implement from left to right. Like I said, the first part is just planning and getting your game plan in front of you. So now instead of again, grabbing every single source that we can think of, instead we're just grabbing the ones and the tables from that deliverable and loading them into our central landing zone and establishing those initial conventions. So what's the naming convention for every source system? Where does it live? But we're only doing it for the ones that we care about. Then we create that staging layer. And then I also have here that you would create the development environment. You're kind of establishing that workflow along the way create the warehouse table next, turn those into a Mart. In this case, it's just one, but I just have those three for reference. And then ultimately create the final deliverable using the Mart. And as you can see here, we've implemented from left to right. And by the end of that, you have your full pipeline and an example of not just the modeling in this case, but also your workflow. You have development environments, you have version control potentially and automation and testing and all that stuff. It's established just with that one pipeline. And now you can go back and uh, do even more with it. All right. So again, we talked about some example deliverables, but here are a few more. And of course that would be really dependent on your team and what you guys are focused on, but hopefully that helped clear up what this one deliverable approach is all about and how it really can help you establish that minimum viable data model that you can then rinse and repeat and use for everything else going forward.